It's question show time, your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, take a second, write it down, I gather them up and I will answer them here or in the comments, which I'm sure you've all noticed that I do. Again, a big thank you to the patrons, thanks to them, we've been doubling up the Guide to Space episodes. I hope you've noticed, I hope you've appreciated. Uh, so if you can, just take a second in the comments and thank the patrons. Uh, it'll mean a lot to them and it means a lot to us. All right, let's get into the episode. Sciolist, is techno-optimism blinding us to the challenges of space exploration? I'm not sure that techno-optimism is blinding us to the challenges. I think that the people who are actually doing the work of space exploration, the, um, the you know, NASA and ESA and the Chinese and the Indians and the Japanese, they are aware. They've suffered the space failures. The Russians lost all of those missions to Mars. They sent so many spacecraft to Venus to understand how difficult it is to get down into that environment. They understand how these missions fail, the tolerances that are required, and how you can't fix things remotely. And so I think that the people who are doing the work are, are adequately um, skeptical, adequately um, they're ambitious, but at the same time they are realistic about how difficult this challenge is. I think it's that next level where you see people who were raised on science fiction, who've been reading science fiction books, who uh, are in the comments of other videos here, who like are really excited and they're really frustrated that we're not getting to the our Dyson spheres and colonies on Mars. And it's that gap. And I think it is this journey that we all have to take. We all start out when we're, we get interested in space exploration in the first place, probably because of science fiction or because of some TV show or something that gets us really excited in what's going on. And then we immediately are so fascinated by the biggest, most complicated stuff, the black holes and the wormholes and the warp drives and the, and, and then as we learn more and more about the field, we realize which are the things that are probably impossible, probably never going to happen in our lifetime, in any lifetime. And we get more and more interested in the minute changes. And the, and I think that it is this, it's this process that we all go through of just, how oh, it's like a maturing, I guess. Um, and what's wonderful is that when you do get to sort of the other side of this, and you get really familiar with all of the different missions and all the different tweaks and improvements and changes and new accomplishments and new discoveries, then it becomes really fascinating and it isn't sort of living in a fantasy land where you get constantly frustrated because these things aren't happening. And then when really amazing things happen, like what SpaceX is doing with rockets that land again near their launch pads and, and the developments of the Starship, you can see these glimpses at this future as it moves forward. And so I don't think that the... I feel like if you're really into space and astronomy, you will go through this process where you want to just talk about black holes in the beginning and then eventually you want to talk about the various nuances of the missions and the discoveries and astronomy and cosmology and space flight and all that kind of stuff. And, and those, and then you're kind of at the level of realism and understanding that the scientists and the engineers who are actually working on this stuff are, are at. So I think the techno-optimism is always really important. It's always really vital for us to be optimistic and excited about the future and not be jaded and numb to what's going on. And at the same time, to really appreciate the small changes as they happen bit by bit. That is, for me now, what is very exciting about all of this stuff that's going on is, is to see these, these, these new accomplishments as they just build up over time. So that's my take on it. Mike Schatz. I know I'm off topic here, but why doesn't NASA have semi-permanent satellites around Mercury, Venus, and Mars so we could see the planets live all the time like we have the pleasure of seeing Earth? There at various times have been satellites at all of those places you just mentioned, right? Uh, NASA's Messenger spacecraft was at Mercury for a long period of time, sending a bunch of data back. Bepi Colombo is on its way to Mercury. And then at Venus, right, you've got ESA's Venus Express, and you've got the Japanese Akatsuki. And then at Mars, you've got like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you've got Mars Express from ESA, you've got the Mars Orbiter Mission from India. So there's a pile of spacecraft that are 
in space and then of course all of the rovers down on the surface. So there have at various times been plenty of spacecraft around all of these, these worlds. The key is, is that getting the data from another place like Mercury or Venus or Mars is more complicated, more time consuming than to, have, to just have the data be transmitted from low Earth orbit. But that said, you can go to say the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or the Curiosity rover and you can get access to the raw footage, the raw images that all of these spacecraft are taking of Mars and it is hundreds of thousands of images. So you're not going to get this really cool real time globe of Mars that's just there, but you are going to get just more images, high resolution of every part of Mars that you could ever hope to look through in your lifetime. And this data is constantly be, being sent back and more spacecraft as they go out there, you're going to get even more of this data all coming back. There are hundreds of thousands of images that were sent back from the Cassini spacecraft and they're all there raw on the internet for you to go through from dawn, from um, uh, you can go through all of the images from OSIRIS-REx. So all this stuff is out there. It's just the transmission times and it's sort of in this raw format that scientists need to, or I mean anyone can go and grab the images, but generally scientists will take these images and then start to do various processes on the images to try and pull out some of the scientific data that they're looking for. But, but it's all there if you want to go look at it. I'll put a bunch of links in the, in the show notes so you can go and see some of the raw images and, and go crazy. Jay Whiteley 7 Hey Fraser, love what you're doing. I have a question. I've heard it said many times that very distant parts of the universe are unreachable because of the universe expanding, but if the universe ends up not being infinite and instead wraps around on itself like many theorize, then won't eventually everything come back around? Right, so this comes down to the question of whether or not the universe is finite or infinite. And so the infinite universe is weirdly easier to wrap your head around, right? It's this idea that the universe goes on forever. Um, in all directions. And so, of course, you're not going to get the universe to wrap around on itself. But if the universe is finite, then imagine this sphere, right? Where, but, it, but it's not, a, but it's sphere where the, if you go all the way on the right side, you'll end up on the left side and you'll come back to your starting location. Kind of like with the Earth, where if you go in any direction, you'll return to your starting place. And this is the kind of thing that astronomers have actually looked for. They've looked out into space, and they've tried to see if large-scale structures on one side of the universe map to large-scale structures like a mirror image on the other side of the universe to tell you that you're, you're actually looking at the same thing, just you're looking at it from the left-hand side that way, and then you're seeing it from the right-hand side that way, but it's the same thing which I know blows your mind. But that still doesn't mean that we could ever get to this stuff because we definitely know that the universe is expanding and that expansion is accelerating and these things are getting farther and farther away from us. And yeah, if the universe was really small, then maybe we could reach them, although it's not like they're going to push towards you. It's just that you could return to your starting point. Um, but, but it turns out that right now you, astronomers still don't know whether the universe is finite or infinite because they don't see those mirroring objects. And so the universe could still be infinite, could still be finite, but it is definitely bigger than the observable universe that we see. It's a fraction of what the real universe actually is. Story Spren. Could the Great Attractor be a weirdly large clump of dark matter? And regardless of what it is, is there any way that we could see what it is without waiting the millions of years or sending something thousands of light years out of the galaxy? Would gravitational waves work when we have more precise instruments or would the galactic center interfere with those in some way? The mystery of the Great Attractor has been solved. Right? We know what the Great Attractor is. It is a whole bunch of galaxies that happen to be on the other side of the core of the Milky Way. And we know this because astronomers have used infrared telescopes, which the wavelengths of infrared light are able to go through the gas and dust that obscures the core of the Milky Way. We can see the region around the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, and we can see these galaxies on the other side of the core of the Milky Way. The Great Attractor is nothing weirder than a lot of galaxies that happen to be on the other side of the Milky Way. Now, it is a coincidence that our position in the Milky Way happens to be that we have to look through the core of the Milky Way to see downtown super Virgo cluster. 
but uh, there's nothing super weird about what it is. And so because there is this extra amount of gravity there in the sort of the, the core of this gigantic supercluster of galaxies, then galaxies are all kind of sliding towards, and they're all bound in that direction, including the Milky Way. So at this point, uh, anyone who tells you that the, the, the great attractor is a mystery, that's like 20 year old speculation. We, we know what it is now. Gray. Hey Fraser, what approximately is the largest optical telescope that could be constructed on the moon? Wild speculation, welcome. <laughs> so let's talk about like the largest telescope on Earth, which is the plan is was the overwhelmingly large telescope. And that was going to be a 100 meter telescope. And the engineers with the European Southern Observatory calculated that that was about the largest possible telescope that you could build on Earth before your cost just went astronomical because of the amount of structural integrity that you would need to keep a telescope that big operating. So the gravity on the moon is about one sixth the gravity on Earth. So you could build a telescope that is six times bigger. So a telescope that is 600 meters across before the gravity on the moon starts to pull down your telescope and make it an unfeasible place to put a telescope. But why on the moon? Why not just build a telescope in space? There's no limit. You could build a 10 kilometer telescope, a 100 kilometer telescope in space. There's no gravity um, to pull you in any one direction. You're in balance. And so you can build a telescope as big as you want. So I don't understand why people want to put things on the moon. The moon is like another gravity well. Don't go into gravity wells if you've already made it out. The moon is going to be very expensive for us to put anything down there, to construct there, to maintain there. Let's just build this stuff in space. Hamel Shamel. Once you said your thoughts on crop circles that are found all over the world in perfect shapes, sizes, etc., maybe unsubscribe. Dude, open your mind. Not everything is in a book, and considering most of what you're saying are theories anyway, I find it astounding that you don't believe in other life, especially when you can't explain the whys of quantum physics, but will try to theorize whatever to explain it. When I look at crop circles, um, they are corn and other crops pressed down into a farm. And so corn smushing technology does seem available to human beings. The precision of that corn smushing is really down to the resolution of stalks of corn. And scientists are able to create pieces of hardware, metal, titanium, down to precisions that are just a couple of atoms thick. Think about a computer and the semiconductors, all of the pathways in there. We're down to just a few nanometers. So human beings have figured out precision. And when you're dealing with the resolution of corn, um, a stock of corn, it's not that precise. So do we have the method to push corn over? Yes. Do we have the ability to um, make things precisely? Yes. What else is there? Right? I mean, so, so there is a perfectly reasonable reason why uh, corn could be pushed over by human beings. So unless there is some evidence that says that it's something other than human beings, why would you believe that it's anything else? Right? So the question really comes down to what are the methods that you use to determine if something is true in this world? What is the amount of evidence that you require? And I require evidence that is compelling. It sounds like you require, if someone just says a thing and asks a bunch of questions and goes, I don't really know what's going on here, that is the amount of evidence that you require. P44 man. I would be interested in seeing a deeper dive into the orbital mechanics since you can only steer it by turning the mild propulsion on or off by rotating towards the sun or away from it. A chemical rocket can also only be turned on or off, but you can point it, whereas you really can't control where the sun is. So what can and can't a solar sail reach? When you think about solar sails, it's really important to understand that it is not like a solar sail is just hanging in space above the sun and the, and the photons are coming off of the sun and the solar sail is getting pushed away out into space and you can't really turn it in any way, right? It's just going to get, it, it can either just be pushed away from the sun or it can turn and fall into the sun. And that's not what's happening, right? A solar sail 
has been launched from the Earth. And so it is going 30 kilometers per second around the sun, just like the Earth. And then when the solar sail turns in one way, then the photons are bouncing off of the off of the sail and they are causing the solar sail to raise its orbit. So it's going to be getting farther away from the sun than the earth is. Now, ironically, it slows down its orbital velocity as it gets farther away, but, and that's how orbital mechanics works. But a solar sail can also turn itself in the other direction. So angle in the complete opposite direction so that the photons of the sun are slowing it down in its orbit which causes it to lower its orbit, get closer to the sun, and speed up. Again, orbital mechanics will break your brain. So solar sails will work the exact same way that rockets do, is that they will change their orientation to the sun to change the orbit that they're looking to do. The way a chemical rocket fires in the direction that it's going to be able to raise its orbit, or it turns around, it fires in the opposite direction to cancel out its orbital velocity and, and lower its altitude. And solar sails are gonna work the same way. So really, where solar sails can't go is when they are far away from sunlight. The far they get away from the sun, the less solar radiation they're getting, less photons they have to work with, and the less propulsion that they can get access to. Solar sails will work really well closer into the sun and worse farther away from the sun. Dave Benoit. Hey Fraser, do we have any evidence of a solar system that has twin planets orbiting in each other's L3 Lagrange point? So for people who aren't aware, the, L the Lagrange points are these places of stability in orbits. And you get them when you have any two objects. So the Sun and the Earth have five Lagrange points of stability. One that is in between the Earth and the Sun, one that is on the far side of the Earth, one that's on the far side of the Sun, and then one that is ahead of the Earth in orbit, and one that is behind the Earth in orbit. And the ones that are lined up with the Earth and the Sun, the L1, L2, and L3, they are meta-unstable. And L3 is the one that's on the far side of the sun. And so the thing is, is that if you put anything into that location, it will eventually drift away from it. And especially when you think about the fact that the, the Earth's orbit isn't circular, it's an ellipse. And so as the Earth gets farther and, and closer to the sun over the course of its orbit, anything that's in that Lagrange point is going to drift away. You can use less propellant to stay in that location, but you still do need propellant. And so a planet, um, well, sorry, that's the first thing. The second thing is you can only put things in the Lagrange point, which are essentially zero mass compared to the other two objects. So you could put a spacecraft into the L3 Lagrange point, um, a space station, um, but a teapot, but you couldn't put a planet. It wouldn't be stable. So you need to have something that is a fraction of the mass of the other two objects. And so if you tried to put a planet on the far side of the sun in that Lagrange point, it would, over the course of a couple of years, drift out of that Lagrange point, and eventually the two planets would crash into each other. So no, we haven't seen it happen, and it's impossible. So, so, and we never, so we never will. Yari Hakalati. Shouldn't the frost line expand with time so that maybe some of the asteroids might not be as eroded by the sun since they are just entering the frost line, so there might be a chance to catch those vaporizing water molecules? Right, so this is a callback to a previous episode. The frost line is this point in the solar system where any closer and any water ice is going to sublimate because the radiation from the sun is just so much. If you get farther away, then the radiation in the sun isn't enough and you're going to get um, ice can just remain. And that's why, say, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are icy, while the moons of the inner planets are not. And there's a spot where some of the asteroids have ice on them and some of them don't. And over time, right, the sun is heating up every year as the sun continues to consume hydrogen in its core. Helium is piling up. It's building up this additional shell around it. And the sun is expanding a little bit and it's getting a little bit hotter, putting out more radiation. And that is going to cause the frost line to slowly move out in the solar system, but at a very slow rate. And I can't think of a way that you could actually capture the water ice that is being liberated. And even if you did, it's being blasted out into deep space. The sun is getting rid of it 
all the way out of the solar system and it's going off to other stars. So I, you want to get at that ice before the sun starts to expand and blast it away. Tau Ceti. Does a star have to be main sequence to support life? What about a red giant like Mira? This is an unsolved question. We don't know what are the conditions it's going to take to support life. Do we need to have a planet that is exactly like the Earth with a large moon and an atmosphere and a magnetosphere orbiting a sun-like star with other planets like Jupiter to be able to protect it from asteroid strikes? Maybe. Um, can we have life around a red dwarf star where the planets are tucked in tight and they are tidally locked and they have no moons and there's giant flares that go off? Maybe. Um, and could you have a planet that is around a red giant star that is out beyond the orbit of Saturn? Um, maybe. Um, the question really just comes down to, will they have a habitable zone? Will they have a place where water can remain a liquid around that star? And even a red giant star is going to have a habitable zone. It's going to have this region where liquid water is possible, where the temperature is right and liquid water could be possible around that star. But we just don't know yet what all the other conditions, all the other factors are. Part of the problem with those giant stars is they have a very short life. Once stars are, are a lot more massive than the sun, the amount of years that they're going to live comes down dramatically. So the most massive stars, the big ones, the betel juices and stuff, they only last a couple of million years from when they form to when they explode. And so it would be really hard for life to get going. That's why the red dwarf stars are a lot more interesting because they're small, they're going to last 10 trillion years, and that's a lot of time for life to figure out how to get going, to be able to survive, to evolve, and deal with what could be a very hostile environment. And it seems like the sun is sort of that perfect sweet spot where you've got a lot of radiation coming off the star to feed an ecosystem of a planet, but it's not causing a lot of flares, and but it's going to last for billions of years, which gives life a lot of time to get going and thrive. So in theory, but life had better work quickly before its star explodes. Podkova. Here's a pretty banal question. How do they deal with more serious ailments in space? For example, what happens if you get a tooth cavity or need a few stitches? Do astronauts have to know basic medical procedures or do they just have to grin and bear it until they come back to Earth? And is there something like a space blood bank in case someone needs a transfusion? The astronauts are incredibly well trained, right? They're already uh, able to do rocket science and pilot test aircraft and they've got multiple degrees. Many of them are already medical doctors, but the ones that aren't, uh, they do receive a bunch of medical training, uh, first aid training and whatever that NASA thinks could be the kinds of risks that they could face. Now remember that on the International Space Station, they are just an hour away from being able to return to home. So if something really bad happens, they hop in their Soyuz and they escape the station and they land on Earth and they can go into a hospital almost as quickly as, as someone who's in like the country can get to a hospital, be airlifted out, right? But that shows that as we push out farther into the solar system, when we go to say the moon and if we ever go to Mars, that the risks are gigantic and that the astronauts are going to need to be completely self-contained. If there's any medical issue that happens, they're going to need to be able to deal with it all themselves or people are going to die. And this is just the reality of getting farther and farther away from the Earth. Until we've got hospitals on Mars, um, it is one of the downsides. And, and yeah, I mean, imagine, right? The astronauts are on their way to Mars and somebody has a tooth infection. And that can be life-threatening if it's bad enough. And so they've got to be able to have everything they need to be able to give a person a root canal or pull a tooth. So um, it's not such a big deal today but it's going to be a gigantic deal in the future. Michael Shadron. Hi Fraser, I have a question regarding radial velocity method of detecting planets. If there's more than one planet, how can you distinguish the tug on the star compared to only one planet? The radial velocity method is where astronomers watch the light from the star, they watch how the Doppler shift, how the light from that star turns bluer or redder as the star is coming towards or away from us. And it's doing that because it's being yanked at by the gravity of the planets that are orbiting around it. And so yeah, in a multiple planetary system, astronomers will have to tease out the changes in velocity. And an example of something that I can think of 
that's kind of similar to this is here on Earth we have the tides, right? And so we have the tide from the moon and we have the tide from the sun. And there are times when the tide, when the sun and the moon are pulling from the same side and we get bigger than normal tides. And then other times when the tide from the sun and the moon are on opposite sides of the earth and so we get medium sized tides. And we've come to be able to predict how all those different tides are going to be based on the positions of the planet, of the, of the sun and the moon. And so as astronomers look through the data, they watch how this radial velocity changes. And if it's just a really clear up down signal, then it probably means there's one. But if it's kind of messy and it goes up, but then it doesn't peak as high the next time, then there's clearly multiple planets that are going on. And over time, astronomers can figure out how many planets are in that system that are contributing to create these funny signals that are coming from the star. But it's like I am oversimplifying. It is so complicated and they use tremendous computing power to do it and mathematics and it's really uh, an amazing accomplishment that they can do it at all. All right, so that wraps up uh, this week's question show. Thanks everyone who put in your questions. As always, wherever you are on my channel, question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, we'll see you next week.